You remember what it was like when you first fell in love? Think of all the goofy things that you did when you first started dating your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your husband or your wife. You'd get home from a date and you'd call her just to talk some more. You'd stay on the phone for hours just to feel close and near. You'd sacrifice anything for him, anything for her. When she made that loud squeaky noise when she sneezed, you thought it was adorable. You'd rub his feet at the end of a hard day. If she wanted to eat somewhere that you absolutely hated, it didn't matter because you were with her. Yaya's, absolutely, it's my favorite place of all time. I love eating little pieces of steak that I can't even see. Who cares if I need to eat another meal after that? I can't wait to go to Yaya's with you. She would say, Burger King again? I would absolutely love that. That sounds incredible. You spent hundreds of dollars on flowers and made your own cards for special occasions. They were filled with words of love and admiration. I guarantee there's a bunch of y'all that wrote poems in here. You'd watch stupid old movie musicals, even the Hallmark Channel, with a good attitude. She'd go to football games with you, and you were actually convinced she enjoyed it. Everything was okay as long as you were together. And why'd you do that? And it's because you loved her. You loved him. And your love overwhelmed common sense and reason and logic. It was all heart. But now you've been married 20 years. And it's irritating when he calls you in the middle of your favorite TV show. Doesn't he know Gilmore Girls is on? I don't even know what that show is. You can't wait to get off the phone when she calls you. Get back to more important things. Why can't she just sneeze a little quieter? Does she not realize that the entire church hears her when she sneezes and has that loud echo effect on the back end of it? You wouldn't rub that man's feet for $1,000. Yayas? Nope, not me. Go with your friends. No way I'm eating at that place. I want real food, not sissy food. Burger King again, how about Burger King never? (laughs) Flowers, they are a waste of money. They're gonna die next week. And cards, why would I spend $5 on a card that you're just gonna throw away? Here's a sticky note. (laughs) You would rather go to the dentist than sit in front of the Hallmark Channel. In fact, you buy separate TVs so you can watch the football game while she watches The Sound of Music for the 37th time. Does that sound familiar? Not to me. (laughs) Not a single one of those things happens in my home. (laughs) But it shouldn't be that way, should it? You still love her. You still love him. But along the way, something happened. John wrote the book of Revelation. It was a vision given to him by God. And in chapters 2 and 3, there are specific messages from God for seven churches. And these messages are more than just an instruction for those churches, but they're instructions and warnings for us. The first message was to the church in Ephesus. It was a church planning church known far and wide for their evangelism efforts. They were a strong church, one of the leading churches of that time. We pick it up in Revelations 2.1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. And if you haven't read chapter one of Revelation, you are really confused by what that means. But those are the words taken from John's description of Jesus in chapter one. So it makes it obvious that these are the words of Jesus to the church in Ephesus. And he says, I know your deeds, and your hard work. The church in Ephesus was not lazy. It was an active church doing lots of good things for God. They had community outreaches, bridge events, ministries, programs, potlucks, bake sales, services every night. If you wanted it in a church, they had it. They worked hard and they did good things for God and for the kingdom. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. The church in Ephesus overcame obstacles. 
This was not an easy time to be a follower of Jesus. The pressure from government and society and religious leaders was to turn your back on Jesus. But this church was determined to continue in spite of obstacles. They were a determined church. When it was raining, church was still full. When the air conditioning was broken, they didn't complain. They gave their money even when times were difficult. This was not a weak, lazy church. They were determined to do right and to do good. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. They were a smart church. They knew the word of God. And when false teachers tried to lead them in error, they weren't fooled. They didn't follow the latest trends. Instead, they were solid and grounded on the word of God. Manipulative and deceptive people didn't fool them. They had the right wise people in leadership. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. They were a committed church. They were not only pressured to turn their back on Jesus, they were even persecuted. Believers were thrown in jail for their faith. Some were even killed. Hard times revealed the commitment level of the Ephesian church. And through it all, they didn't get tired of doing right or doing good. Their commitment level was through the roof. And doesn't that sound like a great church? Active, determined, smart, and committed. That's the kind of church I want to attend. And wouldn't you like that to be said about you? That's kind of the goal. Derek is active, committed, smart, and determined. Sarah is active, determined, smart, and committed. If we use those four words to describe someone, we're saying they are awesome. I would take a thousand people like that. He's active. If it happens at this church, he's a part of it. You should see how many ministries he's involved in. She's determined. Sickness doesn't even keep her away. No matter the weather or what's happening in her life, she is solid and dependable. She is committed. She's been teaching that class for 30 years. And I even heard that she had her first child on a Saturday night. And sure enough, the next Sunday morning, she was there teaching the third grade boys. She was five minutes late, but she's committed. And no matter what happens, what goes wrong, you can always count on her. I've never seen someone as committed as her. We promote people like that. We want them in ministry and in leadership positions. We give plaques and awards to active, determined, smart, and committed followers. Those are all good things. In fact, they're wonderful things. I thank God for an incredible church. I have never seen a group of people more committed to the mission and the vision of a church than you. You are incredibly determined. It's inspiring how many people will get involved and work together to make a difference. And when other pastors hear us talk about First NLR, they are amazed at the commitment level of the people. You are known all over America for your hard work and your love for people and your heart for missions. And that was the church in Ephesus, known far and wide for their good work. They were a leading church. And the opening words of this message from Jesus had to make them feel really, really good. God knew their deeds. But the next part had to feel a little bit like a gut punch. Verse 4, yet I hold this against you, you have forsaken your first love. The King James Version says that they left their first love. Their love had grown cold. They were still doing all the right things. They were active and determined and smart and committed. But in spite of all of that, somehow they lost the spark, the energy, and the passion of being in love with Jesus. When you first became a Christian, do you remember how excited you were about Jesus? How much you enjoyed church and reading your Bible and praying? You were early to every service and you couldn't wait for it to start. 
There's no way you'd ever miss church. You came on Saturday night, Sunday morning, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. If the doors were open, you were here. You were passionate in worship. You were quick to respond when challenged to confess sin and to receive prayer. You delighted in opening your Bible each day to learn more about the God who saved you. You took prayer seriously. You were excited that you actually got to talk to Jesus. You were always excited and wanted to share about what you learned at church. You told anyone and everyone about the difference that Jesus made in your life. And it's sad, but I've heard it so many times. People see someone like that and they say, they'll come back to earth. You can't live on that level all the time. I just give them a little time. They're a little excited. After all, they are a new Christian. It's just a spiritual high. Like it's some kind of condition to be a new Christian. When you were first in love with your husband or your wife, they could do no wrong. You just wanted to be with them every second you could. And it's kind of sad that changes. When you first fell in love with Jesus, you couldn't wait to spend time with him. You were just in love with him and his word. And it's sad that changes. We replace passion with activity, emotion with commitment, enthusiasm with intellect, and then we declare that to be maturity. And all too often, we're actually proud of that maturity. I've heard it. We don't need all that emotion. They're just shallow and immature. I'm mature. And Jesus' response to that supposed maturity You've left your first love. You see, God appreciates your activity and your intelligence and your determination and your commitment. But what he wants more than anything is your heart, your love for him. And reading this passage, I began to wonder, how do you know if your love has grown cold? How do you identify the warning signs that you are headed in that direction? I certainly don't know all the answers, but I want to give you some thoughts, things to watch for. Some of these you can see and observe in others, but let's let this be a self-test. Many of these only you can answer. It's internal. It's a condition of your heart. Number one, when you worship less. Every weekend, I watch you worship And your outward response to God is a clue of what's going on in your heart. And I always worry when I see someone less involved in worship than they once were. If you've ever been more excited about worshiping God than you are now, that's a danger sign. And I know what you can say. Well, it's not my personality. Well, it used to be your personality. And I'm not just talking about the outward, whether you raise your hands and dance and sing, but are you engaged? Are you connecting with God in worship? Number two, when what you do for God becomes more important than the time you spend with God. If you define your relationship with God by what you do, even good things, that's a warning sign. God wants more than your activity. He wants your love and your passion and your heart and your time. He wants to spend time with you. Pastor Rod taught the kids at kids camp this year. It's not what I do. It's what I be. Now, I know that is terrible grammar, but it's true. It's not what I do. It's what I be. My paycheck doesn't tell Meredith that I love her. I can say, hey, I bring home the money. That should let you know I love you. I pay for gas. I put food on the table. Those are things that I do. But it's the time that I spend with her that sends the message that I love her, that my love hasn't grown cold. And it's the same with God. It's not about what you do. It's about your love and your time with him. Number three, when you are less sensitive to God's presence, Maybe you find yourself thinking, you know, I, I just don't feel anything. People can be jumping and shouting and falling and weeping all around you, but you don't feel anything. Have you ever been there? I, I've been there. And you wonder if everyone around you is just nuts. 
How is it possible that I could be missing what they are all apparently experiencing? And every once in a while, someone will leave the church and give the reason, well, I just don't feel the presence of God. Most of the time, that's not a church problem. When God's people are together, he's there. It's more likely a personal issue. It's a warning sign. Number four, when you're going through the motions, when you are doing all the right things without any of the emotion or the feeling. You can't evaluate someone else on this one. Again, self-evaluation. Only you really know. But look at Exodus 24. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and his laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. They said, yes, we are all in. We're going to do everything that the Lord wants us to do. And then eight chapters later, they had forgotten all about God and were dancing around a cow drunk. I'd say it's pretty obvious they were just going through the motions. You know what you're supposed to do. You become a church robot. Raise your hands, sing, smile, take notes, go to the altar, pray. But you're not feeling anything. You're numb. You're not broken. And here's a good question to ask. How long has it been since I have been moved to tears? When's the last time I cried in church? And don't say it's not my personality. Listen, I don't cry at sappy movies, sad stories when I'm hurt or when I'm sad. But the presence of God consistently brings me to tears. We all need to allow God to break through our tough shell and bring us to a place where we can weep in his presence. Number five, when you move from celebrating to complaining, you begin to listen to a different voice. You criticize anything and everything. Crummy jokes, not funny at all today. Not enough new people, too many new people. The sermon was too long. The sermon was too short. The sermon was too boring. The pastor doesn't yell enough. Singing the same old songs. We're singing too many new songs. We're singing too much. We're singing too little. The music's too loud. The music's too quiet. The pastor shouldn't dress like that. It's raining. I don't like connections class. Bridge events are a waste of time. It's too cold in here. It amazes me the things that people will complain about in church. But I've observed that people who are passionately in love with Jesus overlook almost anything especially when it comes to style or preference. And I really notice it any time I go overseas. A few years ago, I was with a group of our students and leaders in a small church on an island in Africa. Concrete blocks with little holes for airflow. There was certainly no air conditioning. A metal roof that made the already incredible hot building like an oven. And that roof was covered in small rocks that local villagers would throw onto the roof during services to try to interrupt the pastor. You had two seating options, uncomfortable wooden benches, or if you were really lucky, you got a plastic lawn chair. And that doesn't keep them from worship. They don't care if the building is too hot or too cold. They don't have air conditioning or padded seats. Church might last for four hours, and the music is always too loud, distorted, and most of the time bad. But it doesn't matter to them. They are worshiping and celebrating Jesus. We get emails if the free coffee isn't the right flavor. <laughs> Come on. When you first fell in love, you couldn't find a thing wrong with your wife, and now you have a list of all of her faults. Those faults were there all along. You were just so passionately in love that you didn't notice or care. When all the little things about church start to bother you, instead of looking for a new church, check your heart. Check your love. Number six, when your attendance pattern changes. Sunday morning, connections class, Wednesday night, Tuesday night. Your presence reveals your priorities. When you choose something else over God's house, you indicate a shift in your priorities. Now, does going to church a lot mean you love Jesus? No, of course not. But when you have less time for him, that's a warning sign. Number seven, you have less passion for the lost. 
you couldn't care less if people are saved or not. Now, I know you would never say it that way. You just no longer get excited when people come to Jesus. And I'm not talking about soul winning ability, but a genuine desire to see the lost come accept Jesus and a desire to do your part. The Bible says that angels rejoice when one sinner comes to Jesus. Do you? Or is that just another moment in church life? Some people actually slip out of church early when we ask people to bow in prayer. Now, what kind of message do you think that sends? Are you really that hungry? When we bow our heads in prayer, we're not going through some meaningless ritual that gives you cover to slip out and claim a table at a restaurant or set up for your connections class. When we bow our heads in prayer, we are changing our posture in an effort to engage with the all-powerful, wonderful God who created you and saved our souls. He is worthy of our stillness and our attention. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are worthy of the quiet, undistracted time for him to work in their hearts and lives. Those are holy moments. Be still. Number eight. When the attention of people matters more than the approval of God. Boy, it sure is a pool, isn't it? Do you worry about what people think more than what God desires? When you're dating, you'll wear matching shirts. You'll take goofy pictures. You'll do all the cheesy stuff you've ever heard of. Why? Because you're in love. But when you're married, not a chance. What will people think? Suddenly, what people think matters. When you were first saved, you didn't care what anyone else thought. You sang loud, you raised your hands, you jumped up and down, you were shouting hallelujah all the time. You were so excited and thankful for the grace of God that you wanted to express it in any and every way possible. And now you don't want to look foolish or extreme. After all, what will people think? I can't raise my hands in worship. What will my friends say? I'm not going to share my faith with them. What if they stop being my friend? When you are more worried about what people think than you are excited about worshiping and thanking God, your heart is headed in the wrong direction. Number nine, when you don't long for his presence. When you are passionately in love with Jesus, you long for his presence. You can't wait to spend time with him. And when you don't get enough time with him, you feel empty. So do you long for his presence? And those are things to look for, some warning signs. And don't check someone else, check yourself. Where am I at? Has my love grown cold? And here's the key question. Have I ever been more passionately in love with Jesus than I am right now? If the answer is yes, that's a danger. So if your love has grown cold, if you are less in love with Jesus than before, what do you do? Jesus gives the answer. Verse 5, remember the height from which you have fallen. First, remember. Think back to the time when you were more passionate about Jesus. Remember what it felt like to be in love with him. Remember the energy you had and how you couldn't wait to worship. How excited you were to be in his presence. Remember. Remember the height from which you have fallen and repent. God, I'm, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for getting my priorities mixed up. Forgive me for being so busy that I neglected my relationship with you. Forgive me. I'll change. And remember, repentance is being sorry plus a commitment to change. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Return. Do the things you did when you first accepted Jesus. Don't be afraid to act like a new Christian all over again. Look at your habits, what you did, when you went to church, how you worshiped, and do those things again. Go back to acting the way you did before you got all mature. Return to your first love. 
This would be awesome marriage advice. Remember, repent, and return. And now here comes the warning. This is the difficult part of the message to the church in Ephesus and to anyone whose love has grown cold. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. In other words, you will no longer represent me. I care more about your heart and your love than your deeds. If you won't fall back in love with me, I won't be here. My presence will be here no longer. Those are tough consequences. You can be busy for God and still lose out on your relationship with God. He wants to be first. He wants your passionate love and devotion more than your activity and intelligence and determination and commitment. God wants your heart. And it's time to return to your first love. And what's the reward? Verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. In other words, those who love me and follow me will be with me in heaven for eternity. So the questions to ask yourself today, have you ever been more in love with Jesus than you are right now? Have you ever been more passionate about him? Have you ever been more connected to him in prayer and in worship? And if so, it's time to remember and to repent and return to your first love. Would you bow your heads with me? If you just say, you know what, Pastor Parker, that's me. I, I, I have been more in love with Jesus than I am right now, but I'm ready. I'm ready to go back to my first love. If that's you, just raise your hand. Lift in the air because I want to pray with you. Yeah. There's a lot of us. And then also, maybe you're here and you've never even entered into a relationship with Jesus. You've never even started the journey. But you're ready. And you're ready to, to repent and accept and ask Jesus into your life and to follow him. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. Nobody's looking around, just me. If you say, I'm ready. To start, yeah. Lord, we, Lord, we do what the Bible says is happening right now in heaven. We celebrate and we are so excited for those who have made the decision to follow you and to enter into relationship with you and, and to fall in love with you. Lord, we pray that as they turn their life over to you, that you would just radically change everything about their life. Lord, that they would sense and feel love and joy and peace like they've never experienced. I pray that the freedom that they find in you would happen instantaneously, that the weight and the, the shame and the guilt that they've had on their heart and on their life would just be released, and instead they would walk in the freedom that they've found in you. Lord, I pray that they would be so passionate and on fire and in love with you that they wouldn't be able to contain their joy and their love and their passion, that they would tell everyone about what Jesus has done in their life and how he's radically changed, and that they would never stop being a new Christian, that that passion and that fire would stay with them for the rest of their life, and they would love you and desire you. Lord, I pray for those today who have recognized that some of these warning signs ha have happened in their life and they have been more in love with you than they, they are right now. Lord, I pray that right now you would just remind them of all that you've done for them. Lord, that they would remember the joy that they once had, the peace and the freedom and, and the love that they felt in that moment when you forgave them and they found a new hope and a new life in you. I pray that as they begin this re-journey of finding and falling back in love with you, Lord, that you would just constantly remind them of all that you've done, all the blessings, all the protection, all the wisdom that you've given them. And Lord, we all repent today for ever allowing our relationship with you to be about what we do and not who you are. 
Lord, we commit to being in love with you. We commit to devoting our hearts and our passion and our joy and our worship to you. And before we do anything else, we will love you. And we will let that love be the thing that leads us to every other part of our life. We will not measure our relationship with you by what we do, but instead by the love that we have for you. So Lord, we, we all look back today and we remember that moment when you forgave us and we had new hope and we had new life and we had a new freedom found in you. Lord, we are so grateful and so thankful for your love and your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy that you show us every day. Lord, we want to fall more and more in love with you every day. Thank you, Jesus.